Thanks for joining on this 16th session of Niveshakon Se Samvad on this Saturday morning. Uh, as you know, this Niveshakon Se Samvad has been our flagship initiative which gets well with our care philosophy. It provides an opportunity for our investor to gain knowledge on various instruments and aspects of investing, ask questions and achieve clarity on various investment options. Veterans from various fields have so far participated in these sessions and hundreds of our esteemed investors have benefited from it. Today's session is on digital currencies and all of us have mixed understanding and feeling about this. Are these legal, illegal? Uh, are they going to stay or vanish? How should I look at them? So friends, like you, my mind is also buzzing with these questions. And we have today none other than Mr. Gautam Chugani, who is going to help us wade through this maze of new age currencies. Just to reiterate, this platform is meant for only value addition in terms of knowledge perspective. We don't promote or given any directional call on the same. Now I would like to introduce our new family member, uh, Kamani Naga, who has joined us as head of retail sales. Uh, she has more than 22 years of experience in BFSI industry and she has worked with reputed institutes like iBanks uh, and IDBI Bank, Indian Television Private Limited. So Kamani, I request you uh, to share your views and to introduce Gautam. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Amit. Thank you for your kind words. I think there is no better way to start a weekend, uh, specifically in a week which has just had Saraswati Puja, uh, which has gone by. Uh, yesterday, I was at a conference where I heard something very interesting, which I wanted to share with the audience. Uh, there was somebody who was a speaker and saying that he believes in building up um, his team by enabling them with knowledge. Because Ma Durga um, and uh, Ma Lakshmi is revered by most people maximum number of times. But Ma Saraswati is something that is lesser shared or lesser prayed to. So that's why I think this is one of the ways in which we pay homage to uh, the goddess Saraswati in a way by enhancing people's knowledge. I personally believe that learning knowledge are constants across your life and they never let you down in any circumstance. So I think it's it's a very, very good way to start a, a, a good interaction with um, all our attendees. I would also like to, you know, say that today's topic is indeed very intriguing. Okay, from the days when uh, we used to use barters. So uh, when we started, when we, when we, when I started in banking, the first thing that they do when they take you through an induction session is to teach you how banking evolved and how currency evolved. So currency evolved by barters. Uh, that's how things used to be uh, bought by exchanging things. Then it moved on to, you know, metals, uh, gold, copper were used as currencies. And now we have the latest addition, which is actually currency which you can't hold and feel. So I don't know how it will feel to spend that currency uh, because you actually can't, you can't, it is not at that tangible, right? I'm sure our great expert who's joined us today, who has been, uh, who has taken out the time on a Saturday to give us knowledge. I think thank you very much, Gautam, for being here and for sharing your information with us. As all of you are aware, and you can see on the screen as well, Gautam has, is a senior analyst with Bernstein and has been spending many years uh, researching crypto. He's been dealing with crypto founders and thought leaders. I'm sure he will bring in a lot of perspective on the digital currency piece today. So without wasting any more time, let me hand over to Gautam and let's, uh, uh, let's have a great session with him. Over to you, Gautam. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks, everyone, uh, for joining. So just a quick introduction, uh, as, as uh, I was kindly introduced, uh, I, I work with Bernstein, I cover global digital assets. Uh, my personal journey in crypto started in 2017. Uh, I used to live in Singapore then, uh, and uh, Singapore was a sort of, I would kind of imagine a crypto hub, uh, and probably it still is uh, in Asia. Uh, and a lot of interesting crypto businesses were springing up there. And I kind of saw a lot of them, you know, go from like zero to, you know, almost like global platforms in like six months uh, in a very short time. And and that sort of intrigued me a lot uh, in terms of how, you know, crypto as a technology can empower new businesses to come to the market and launch at a global scale uh, only because, you know, they don't have to, uh, you know, 
in a way, kind of not go to, you know, if you're a financial business, not really go to a bank and seek permissions and API connections uh, or go to, uh, you know, a regulator. And then obviously a lot of things have happened in crypto since then and a lot of regulation has come in. Uh, but it almost seemed like magical uh, back then in terms of how you can just connect to a global ledger and start, you know, empowering your business. Uh, and that was very intriguing for me. So I kind of went all in uh, in terms of uh, both uh, my personal investing and uh, I would say also uh, my 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 personal uh, you know education about about the space. Uh, I you know I, I've I've been with Bernstein for a long time, almost eight to nine years. Uh, so I used to cover Indian banks, financial services. Uh, so covered the likes of HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank for a very long time. Uh, I was also, you know, one of the early mem early participants in McKinsey uh, to kind of bring in the idea of payments and fintech to India. Uh, this was way back in early uh, mid two thousand, late two thousand, uh, and we were very early to the fintech and the payment space. So that's also an area that I understand really well. And obviously, crypto kind of I think forwards that idea of financial innovation, and that's always kind of appealed to me. So without sort of spending any more time, let me just quickly get into. Uh, crypto uh, and and sort of, uh, you know, the sort of the digital assets. Uh, I like to call them as digital assets. Uh, so the sector I cover is called global digital assets. Uh, we I think the idea of currency, you know, always confuses everyone uh, because then you start comparing it to dollar and rupee and then you kind of start comparing the features of it. Uh, but when you kind of approach it with a fresh brain and sort of approach it with a, a fresh set of eyes uh, and just see it as a technology, uh, just to see it as something that's sort of sprung up because of how technology has leapfrogged in terms of the idea of blockchain. Uh, then you kind of start appreciating it on its own. Uh, and then you start seeing it more like an asset uh, and maybe something that's not going away, uh, at least in our lifetime. Uh, so that's that's how I see it. Uh, so just to put this into perspective, uh, all of you all thought crypto was dead. Uh, over the last two years, but let me break it to you that Bitcoin is up 209% over the last one year. Uh, Ethereum, which is the second largest asset, is up 133%. And crypto stocks, uh, which are uh, the the you know the likes of crypto exchanges, which are and and you know other uh, crypto listed companies like Bitcoin miners, which are actually covered within Bernstein, uh, they are up uh, 506% over the last year or so. Uh, and obviously. This was since the point where, you know, crypto had a terrible year in 2022 uh, when we had uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, fiascos. We had one big crypto exchange called FTX go down. Uh, we had uh, multiple smaller entities enter bankruptcy. Uh, obviously, everyone knows that 2021 was a very big greed cycle. Uh, and when that played out, I mean, some people obviously got greedy. Some people were fraudulent. Uh, and all of that came out by 2022. Uh, but since then, uh, you know, this is a technology, it kind of goes on, it kind of has a life of its own. Uh, and since then, uh, we've had a lot of positive developments in the space, uh, a lot of cleanup has happened. Uh, and this price that you're seeing and the recovery that you're seeing is a reflection of that cleanup that's happened. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that. Uh, let me... Uh, and and so I think, so that's probably just the context, right, in terms of what's happened. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about some of these things. We now have an exchange traded fund in Bitcoin called Bitcoin ETF launched by BlackRock, uh, Fidelity, Invesco, uh, Templeton, and some of the leading uh, institutional investors. Uh, this is now approved by the SEC. So obviously the price and all of that, price of Bitcoin and other assets is now starting to reflect this idea of institutionalization of crypto that's happening. Uh, and I'll touch upon some of these topics, but I just wanted to kind of give you a picture because all of you all would have come in thinking that, you know, crypto is dead. What's he going to tell us? Uh, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, one, it has made a spectacular recovery. Second, a lot of space has got cleaned up. It has a lot of clean actors now. Uh, and third, we are going towards institutionalization, uh, which means that uh, the leading institutions like BlackRock and Fidelity are now launching Bitcoin exchange traded funds, uh, which are actually buying Bitcoin in the market. Uh, which is why you know you see the price of Bitcoin going up, uh, and obviously in the same time frame, when you compare it to other assets, so while Nasdaq is up and S and P is up, I mean the rise of crypto has been spectacular. 
Uh, and again, this is in the context of crypto is a high beta asset. So it, when it goes down, it goes down more than NASDAQ. And when it goes up, it goes up more than NASDAQ. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, so I think overall, you know, we think Bitcoin is like gold uh, in a way that uh, it's, uh, and, you know, we can talk about a lot of things in terms of how we look at it. But our closest comparison to Bitcoin is not towards a currency. You know, a currency usually has, you know, it's a means of exchange. It's got purchasing power. Uh, you know, it's it's it can be digital uh, and may not be digital. It could be a digital form of money, of, of, of money or currency. But when you kind of compare it Bitcoin to gold, then you start to see a lot of similarities, whether it's in terms of inflation or scarcity. Uh, gold is obviously not that digital, except if it's an ETF. Uh, fungibility, you know, just in terms of is it able to hold purchasing power relative to the dollar because the dollar gets consistently printed because of monetary authorities wants to, you know, keep providing liquidity and keep printing more money. So just from a store of value perspective, I think Bitcoin is much closer to gold uh, than to a currency. And hence, uh, as I said, you know, the currency term is quite a misnomer. Uh, and so I think that's, so obviously you would have heard the term digital gold. So we think Bitcoin is digital gold. Uh, and, you know, in that sense, you know, Bitcoin's market cap starts to kind of move towards, uh, you know, the overall global market cap of gold. Uh, just a quick introduction to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is, you know, a very simple uh, idea, right? Anything that you actually look at in the financial system is a ledger. Uh, so when you actually, you know, do a you know a bank transaction uh it first goes to the bank ledger and the bank actually someone verifies whether you have that much money in your account before it, you know account is debited and credited uh so similarly somebody has to check a ledger right and usually the ledger checker or the ledger keeper or the bookkeeper is centralized that means it's usually a bank uh and when you actually look at the financial system uh every bank is a ledger in that sense and and from that point of view the 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 central banks actually then act as a you know as a gatekeeper or as, as a bookkeeper of the global of the banking system ledger that means it kind of settles transactions between the banks so similarly bitcoin is also a ledger uh, it is a, a ledger which is actually not maintained by a single party it is maintained uh, on a decentralized basis that means uh, anyone who actually has a computer uh, can actually verify uh, the the ledger uh, but at the same time, you know, the ledger needs a more secure system of verifying the ledger. That means to be able to verify transactions, whether, you know, if if there are 100 accounts on Bitcoin ledger, then what are the account balances of those ledger? If they want to transfer money between each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, are they verified? Are they verified to kind of do those transactions? Are they trying to double spend the money? So that security system that, you know, Bitcoin needs, especially when you don't have a central party like a bank to verify it, uh, usually it's done using this idea of, you know, what are called miners or bookkeepers. I, I like to call them as bookkeepers, but, you know, the word they use is miners, which is Bitcoin miners. Uh, so what Bitcoin miners effectively do, and, you know, you could take the example of this room, if, you know, between Amit, Rishab, uh, Kamyani and me, if we are miners or if we are bookkeepers, you know, we would say that we would verify the copy of the ledger and we are all placed in different locations, right? Uh, so let's say, you know, uh, any any of us want to kind of verify this book or verify this ledger, uh, and the way it is decided who's going to verify the ledger is is actually uh, determined by a, what is called a hash puzzle or or a simple mathematical puzzle. So whoever solves the puzzle first, and it's not a very complex puzzle; it's, it just requires a lot of permutations, combinations, and a lot of guessing uh, to arrive at that answer. Uh, but whoever solves that puzzle first gets to, uh, you know, uh, verify uh, the ledger. So let's say Kamyani kind of first solves the ledger, solves the puzzle. Uh, she gets the right to verify the ledger. And when, when she completely verifies the ledger, she lets everyone else know that this is the final copy of the ledger. And then everyone updates their copy of the ledger. That's how the whole decentralized ledger system works, which is, you know, based on the decentralized ledger technology, you know, software called DLT. But... For the service that the miner, the winning miner or winning uh, bookkeeper has done, which is verified the ledger, uh, they are paid in Bitcoin terms. That's how, you know, new Bitcoin comes into existence. So when Bitcoin started in 2009, uh, the first block or the first group of transactions, uh, a block is nothing but a group of transactions. The first group of transactions that was actually verified uh, was paid 50 Bitcoins. Uh, 
uh, and every 10 minutes there's a new block or there's a new group of transactions that is verified so you know the transaction verification happens like a clock you know it happens like happens every 10 minutes uh, and for every 10 minute every verification there's a new miner who wins you know this hash puzzle contest uh, and whoever wins the hash puzzle contest obviously you know gets gets the reward of you know at that point in time 50 bitcoins uh, but you know obviously the miner is you know what are they using they're using like some kind of uh, computation, some kind of computer to verify the transactions to kind of some kind of uh, to solve the mathematical equation. So they are spending power costs, they are spending chips, uh, which are like computer chips to actually solve these things. Uh, and so obviously they're spending their money, they're spending their resources. And against that, they're obviously, uh, you know, getting paid in Bitcoin. So, you know, miner also runs a business in some ways. He runs a business of verifying the transactions by actually adding computation power, uh, spending money on power. Uh, running a data center almost. Uh, and then in return of that gets paid in Bitcoin terms. And obviously whatever the price of the Bitcoin, it, it determines what the dollar reward for that for that for that uh, miner is. So that's how Bitcoin comes into existence. So the Bitcoin algorithm then issues Bitcoin every 10 minutes to the miner who wins the reward or who wins the right to you know verify transactions by actually solving a cryptographic puzzle. Uh, and the other aspect to keep in mind is that now that we understand how Bitcoin comes into existence and, you know, the way, uh, you know, the miners or the bookkeepers are rewarded, uh, it is important to understand. And, you know, this kind of shows you how it is, you know, you're a transaction, you send a transaction to the wallet and wallet is sent to all these distributed nodes or dis nodes are nothing but computers. Miner basically adds the transaction to the block template, solves the proof of work contest, the POW contest. And then, you know, new block is validated. Then that new block or new group of transactions goes back and updates, you know, the copy of the ledger. So about 1 million miners globally act as validators and bookkeepers for this, which is as decentralized. So I obviously gave you a small example, but actually in the real world, about 1 million miners globally act as validators and bookkeepers. Uh, Bitcoin network is nothing but a software code running across 46,000 computers maintaining the same copy of the Bitcoin ledger. Uh, and miners are paid for their work reflected in, you know, computing power or power consumed. They are rewarded in the new Bitcoin issue. And so obviously this is a lot of detail. I'll not get into it, but I think, you know, broadly my idea was to kind of explain the concept of it. Uh, the other aspect, you know, uh, a lot of people ask, like, where does the, you know, the monetary policy of Bitcoin comes from, right? How do we know how much Bitcoin is there in the world? How much is being issued and so on and so forth. So now this is an open ledger, right? You can go and verify how much Bitcoin has been issued. It's not a complex ledger. It's not something where, you know, you need permission to read the ledger. You can open a computer, you know, download the Bitcoin software and actually then verify, oh, of the 21 million Bitcoin, 19.6 million Bitcoin have been issued. Uh, and how much Bitcoin is being paid to the miners today. So the the way the supply function works is that every four years, the number of Bitcoin that is paid per block or every 10 minutes is reduced by half. That means when the Bitcoin network started in 2009, between 2009 and 2012, about 50 Bitcoin per, you know, per block was paid out. After that, between 2012 to 2016, uh, about, you know, another tw about 25 Bitcoin were paid off. So 50 went to 25. Between 2016 and 2020, uh, you know, it kind of brought, it was brought down further to 12.5. And then further down up between 2020 and 2024, uh, the, the reward was brought down to 6.25. So when you have an equation like that or supply curve like that, where the rewards are halving every four years, then what do you get is basically a lot of the rewards are issued up front, but then over a period of time, the rewards start tapering out. So what has happened over the last, I would say approximately uh, close to about 14 years uh, from since, since you know, Bitcoin has been in existence is that about 19.6 million Bitcoin have been issued. And the Bitcoin supply is such that there is a fixed number of Bitcoin. That means it's a immutable supply though. That means it's unchangeable. That means over a period, over the life of, you know, this whole network until 2140, so, you know, we are in 2024 now, until 2140, about 21 million Bitcoin will be issued, of which 19.5 million have been already issued. That means so far only 1.5 million Bitcoin will be issued in the future. 
and that's it. You can add more mining power, you can add more computation power, it won't matter. The number of Bitcoin that is issued in this world is fixed. It's not, you, it's not like oil or it's not like you know uh, any other commodity where if you add more capacity, you can mine more. In the case of Bitcoin, if you add more capacity, the, the Bitcoin mine is shared between more players or, or so it doesn't change the supply. You can mine, even if there is more demand, the supply is not in response to that excess demand. Uh, so as a result of which the demand can, you know, kind of, the demand can kind of keep, uh, uh, you know, keep going up and down, uh, but the supply remains fixed. Uh, so obviously during periods of time when the supply demand of Bitcoin is low, the price kind of goes down, but then when the demand picks up, the price starts to move up. And, and there are many reasons why demand goes up and down depending on the macro, depending on, uh, depending on you know, the institutionalization. Like I said, there's an exchange traded fund now. Uh, some corporates buy Bitcoin on their balance sheet as a treasury asset, uh, as a store of value asset, just like anyone would buy gold. Uh, so all these demand sources determine the demand function, but the supply curve remains always fixed. And that's the most important part. So when I said Bitcoin is similar to gold is because Bitcoin's inflation is very similar to the gold. Just like gold is in limited supply, Bitcoin is in limited supply. But over a period of time, Bitcoin's inflation is going to become even lower than gold. Uh, because obviously the of the four-year halving that I explained to you, which is every four years, the rewards are going to get cut into half. That means less, the Bitcoin's inflation is going to get cut into half every four years. And that's the most important part. So this idea of scarcity and digital scarcity uh, effectively comes from this idea of, you know, the way the Bitcoin supply curve is. And that's a very important thing to understand uh, when we actually understand Bitcoin. So my advice to you is not to think of Bitcoin as a currency, uh, you know, not to think about it as, uh, you know, as something that, you know, just you think about gold, uh, you know, you say I can wear a jewelry, but something that, you know, this digital world has given to us uh, in the form of a blockchain technology, in the form of a, the idea of a decentralized ledger. And now Bitcoin is nothing but an incentive or a reward to actually maintain that ledger. And as a result of that, because it's maintaining a ledger, uh, that over a period of time, as more and more people have started seeing as a store of value asset or as a as a digital scarce, uh, you know, as as a, as a scarcity asset. And obviously, uh, in this case, the scarcity is digital. Uh, you know, it has kind of grown in value over a period of time. Uh, and obviously, you, all of you all have seen the history of Bitcoin, right? I mean, it's probably the world's best performing asset over the last 10, 15 years, despite the volatility that it has seen. So just to kind of, you know, make it slightly more practical, right? So I cover US listed uh, Bitcoin miners, uh, which are, you know, listed stocks on NASDAQ. Uh, and what has happened over a period of time, you know, the mining industry, which used to be like simple computers, right? I mean, I think I have a chart here, which explains to you. So mining industry used to look like this on the left hand side, right? What you see is this is how people used to mine Bitcoin back in the day. You know, this is still a better setup. They used to mine it in their home, in their basement with computers. And then over a period of time, it started to look like this. And now on the right hand side, you can see this is how Bitcoin mining is looking like. They look like data centers. You cannot make out whether this is an AI data, data center or a Bitcoin data center. This is exactly how a Bitcoin data center looks like. So this is one of the largest Bitcoin mining uh, sites in the world, uh, in North America. Uh, it runs about 750 megawatt facility uh, in Texas. Uh, with 95,000 Bitcoin mining machines. Uh, and some of these companies, you know, so the company that you looked at on the right, on the, the picture you saw is a company called Riot. And Riot is a company that actually is, uh, is, uh, wait a minute, I'm gonna, I think you can't see this. Yeah. So Riot is a company that is on, on the, you know, on the bottom right chart, uh, chart where, you know, you can actually see what is the cost of production for that company in terms of, you know, what, what is called cost curves. So just like any commodity, right, where you have cost curves, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, a metal or gold, uh, you know, the producers of that commodity basically can be put on a cost curve, which means tells you who produces how much at what price. So just like that, Bitcoin miners can be arranged on a cost curve. So what you see here are actually what, what are called, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining cost curves. And so overall, if you see, you know, in terms of the total computation capacity of the network, which is, you know, it's called network hash rate. I won't again get into the details, but broadly it shows you the computation capacity of the network, which is what you see on the 
on on the left hand side and that capacity is broadly between china north america uh, certain parts of asia and canada uh, and as you see over a period of time china used to be a big source of bitcoin mining and as over a period of time that capacity has started to move to north america one because of stability of laws uh, some supportive states actually help bitcoin miners establish themselves into large sites and then finally uh, you know uh, the fact that you know north america has uh, attractive or competitive power cost and power cost is one of the biggest factors in deciding the cost of bitcoin and then over a period of time you can see you know how the cost you know, how each of the countries are placed in terms of the overall global cost curve. And then you can see some of the listed U.S. miners. These are 16 companies which are listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, how how much they produce and, you know, how much over a period of time, uh, you know, uh, what, at what cost of production are they able to kind of produce Bitcoin. So one way to think about the mining business is that today the price of Bitcoin is $52,000. And if you produce Bitcoin at $20,000, the difference between 52 and 20 is your gross margin. And that's how, you know, the mining margins are determined. So obviously it's a difficult business. If you produce at a high cost and the Bitcoin price is low, you can't make money for you. Obviously the most attractive miners and the good quality miners are, are able to produce uh, at scale Bitcoin at a much lower cost of production. And then you can kind of compare that to uh, the, the, the price of Bitcoin to kind of see the gross margins that they make. So just to kind of give you a sense of, you know, the fact that this is not some, uh, woozy uh, uh, activity going on in the world. This is actually becoming into an organized business which listed companies in the space. And, and and obviously this picture tells you how organized the space is becoming in terms of what the Bitcoin mining data centers are looking like. Uh, there are obviously many players in the space. You know, there are chip manufacturers which are specific Bitcoin mining chips. Uh, there are obviously, uh, you know, different uh, manufacturers of these Bitcoin mining machines. Uh, the miners, uh, which, you know, if you look at the site, these are the ones, they actually buy these Bitcoin mining machines from different manufacturers and then run the data centers as, of, as, an, as a full-scale operation. Uh, and then obviously, whatever Bitcoin they earn in a day or in a month, they obviously sell it at the market price uh, to recover their costs. And then obviously, they have to maintain their, you know, their share of the overall uh, capacity. So they have to keep investing back in capacity. The other important, you know, chart to see is that overall, the you know, everyone talks about the energy efficiency of Bitcoin or in Bitcoin mining. As the world, you know, over a period of time, the miners have become more and more efficient. That means they consume much less electricity per cost, uh, per per uh, per unit of uh, you know computation uh, that they generate. So the overall mining uh, efficiency has kind of come, you know, has kind of improved, and you know, the energy efficiency has actually improved. Uh, over a period of time. So this industry is also becoming more energy efficient, uh, much cleaner, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, let me just skip all of this. Yeah, so like I mentioned, right, I mean, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that loss of, you know, overall as gold, you know, the global currencies as they are printed they lose value relative to the to to the gold and then obviously you know bitcoin obviously being a much smaller proportion of the gold in over a period of time actually bitcoin has kind of outperformed gold uh, as a store of value and you know that whole idea of digital gold is with the idea that bitcoin is still a very small part of you know the overall gold market so gold is about 13 trillion market cap bitcoin today this chart is a bit outdated bitcoin is about a 1 trillion dollar of market cap so still the gap between gold and Bitcoin is about 13 times. Uh, Bitcoin, obviously, as I said, you know, over a period of time, you know, Bitcoin kind of works in four year cycles. So obviously, once in every four years, you do see a very difficult, uh, you know, drawdown. So Bitcoin goes down by 60 to 65 percent, like you see it went down in 2022. Uh, similar number, similar thing happened in uh, 2018 and similar, you know, period happened in 2014. So every once in four years, we kind of think about Bitcoin in four year cycles. So we do think that we are in the early stage of a new cycle now, uh, given that we are going towards more institutionalization, more exchange traded funds. Uh, Bitcoin is becoming more mainstream as a digital asset. Uh, and as a result of that, I think we are starting into a new cycle into Bitcoin. So even after these drawdowns every four years, you see that Bitcoin has kind of outperformed, you know, significantly in terms of market cap, right? If you kind of bought Bitcoin in 2014, 
you would have done 158 times. You bought it in 2018, you would have done 14 times your money. Even if you bought it in 2022, uh, which is uh, obviously after the drawdown, you kind of would have done three times uh, your money. Uh, but obviously, you know, like if you buy during periods which are, uh, when you, you know, especially during periods when there's a big drawdown, the returns tend to be very attractive from that point in time. And that's what the history shows. Uh, but regardless, you know, even considering these drawdowns every four years, if you've held Bitcoin for a longish period of time, more than four or five years, I don't think anyone has lost money in Bitcoin. So it's truly a store of value, although with a lot of volatility. So, you know, it's important that uh, if you're in a hurry, you know, if you're looking at a one year investment, uh, then if you kind of invest at the peak of the cycle, you know, you're not going to make your money in one year. So you do definitely need a longer time horizon like you do with any other investment. Uh, and hence, you know, I, I don't like to use the word currency. I think it's an investment. It's an asset. Uh, and you should think about it in, in longer time frames uh, if you really want to do well in Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, I think uh, with that, you know, I don't want to kind of give you any uh, price predictions. Uh, I want to kind of tell you a few uh a few things about uh, what's happening on the institutionalization of Bitcoin. Uh, so the names that you see here from BlackRock to Fidelity to, uh, you know, all the known in asset manager names, they have now actually issued a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, the Bitcoin ETF has done spectacularly well. Uh, oh, you know, about, uh, let me just walk you through some of the numbers in terms of what has happened in terms of, uh, yeah, so this is an interesting chart. Uh, so since the launch of the Bitcoin ETF in about about 10th of Jan is when, you know, the Bitcoin ETF was approved. Uh, we've had close to $5 billion of flows, uh, net inflows into Bitcoin. So this is by far the most successful exchange traded fund launched uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, and this is compares to any other. And, you know, today about, I would say, all, uh, all ETFs combined, uh, Bitcoin ETF combined is about $37 billion. If you look at the ETF of gold, it's about $95 billion. So as I said, I think over a period of time, we do expect the Bitcoin ETF market to become much bigger than the gold market cap. And I think this is a very important thing. You know, anyone who's obviously a big gold fan, I think gold is getting disrupted by Bitcoin. And that's a very important point uh, to be made. Uh, Similarly, I think going forward, uh, we will see, you know, going to other cryptocurrencies or, you know, other digital assets, uh, we will see, for example, Ethereum, I think we will see the same institutionalization narrative happen in Ethereum as well. And the same, you know, asset managers are, uh, have filed for an for a, for a, for a Ethereum ETF as well. Uh, let me kind of uh, walk you through some of the other interesting use cases. Uh, so I think what's really happening here is that, you know, when we kind of go beyond uh, uh, Bitcoin, right? And uh, maybe let me wait on the last, on the most important slide, right? So I think what really has happened with uh, digital assets beyond Bitcoin has been this, you know, obviously Bitcoin is a much simple ledger. It, it basically just uh, focuses on uh, just the transfer of money or the transfer of value. Uh, and, you know, it's, it has its own monetary policy, like I said, which kind of gives it a uh, store of value kind of properties, which kind of makes it similar to gold. But over a period of time, you know, new blockchains have been introduced. In 2014, a blockchain called Ethereum was introduced, which is the second largest digital asset. Uh, and what what Ethereum essentially did was it brought uh, programming or you know computing capabilities to the blockchain. So just like a ledger which is able to just tell you who owns how much Bitcoin in what account, if you add computation or programming capability to the blockchain, you can then actually store applications on the blockchain. And that became a very important thing. But the most important thing about Ethereum is that rather than you know if you look if you kind of you know, if you want to build a financial application or a fintech app, you have to kind of build it on a centralized database or a centralized server. But in the case of Ethereum, it becomes like a decentralized database. It becomes a decentralized computer. And that's the interesting part. So the, it takes the decentralization from Bitcoin. It takes the same blockchain mechanisms and the blockchain technology from Bitcoin, but then adds this layer of programmability, 
uh, computation uh, and 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 uh, and and makes it like a decentralized computer, which then allows you know developers, uh, software developers, to come and build applications on it. Uh, and that's been a very big paradigm shift that's happened in the you know digital asset space and the crypto space, which means that actually now you can actually build a completely new financial system uh, on the blockchain. So Bitcoin, in my view, is not a complete financial system. It's more a store of value asset similar to gold. I think it laid the foundations of a financial system. But I think starting from Ethereum, going into Solana and some of the new digital, uh, you know, new blockchains with very different engineering designs, uh, they are able to then actually provide you programmability and applications. And I think what what we started out, I probably I would say this moment started out in 2019 and 2020 when people started building simple applications on the blockchain. Like, you know, you could take your Ethereum, put it in a collateral smart contract and then borrow against it, like how you do margin lending or margin borrowing. Uh, and then use that money to buy any other digital asset. Uh, you could also go to a you know digital asset, you know a crypto exchange on the blockchain, and then you know provide become a market maker. Uh, so a lot of interesting, you know, I would say toy versions of financial markets started getting built in in you know on on the blockchain, uh, where you know a lot of retail participants could do things which you know usually very sophisticated traditional investors or traditional market participants do in the real markets. And, you know, these toy markets that or toy financial markets that started getting built on Ethereum uh, then became, you know, very interesting case models or, you know, or, you know, models in terms of how you could actually then take the blockchain technology to build large global traditional financial markets on the blockchain with the idea of transparency, instant settlement, uh, you know, instant liquidity, T plus zero settlement, because, Effectively, when you uh, when you actually open when you actually allow an open ledger to uh, build, you know whether you want to build trading markets or any kind of application financial applications, you bring in full transparency. It's a single common ledger; everyone can access it. Uh, there is no the you know there is no scope for fraud because it's an, again it becomes an open verifiable ledger uh, backed by uh, backed by a lot of security. And then at the same time, you know market participants can think about redesigning you know new markets right so one opportunity that some of the players like blackrock and others see is this idea of tokenization a very simple example of tokenization is actually you could take a currency like the dollar and make a tokenized version of the dollar so it's called uh, it could be a digital dollar right so when you think about i'm sure you've heard of this idea of central bank digital currency uh not the digital dollar is very similar to that it basically takes the dollar puts it in a bank account but then tokenizes it on the blockchain and once a digital dollar is on Ethereum, you can imagine what the potential is, right? Because Ethereum is a global ledger. It's accessible in any market. If you have internet, you get access to the dollar. So what has happened is that Ethereum has allowed us to actually then build this very large market called stable coins or, or the market for the digital dollar. Uh, but it could be any other dollar. It could be a digital euro, it could be a digital rupee or anything. But the, obviously the predominant uh, currency that's been used is the dollar. So tokenization has allowed, you know, us to bring the digital dollar on the blockchain. And because Ethereum is accessible in any part of the world, because it's a global ledger, it makes the digital dollar accessible in any parts of the world. And, and that obviously has led to very interesting use cases. Uh, and similarly, I think what we are seeing is that players like BlackRock see the potential of not just tokenizing the dollar, but tokenizing securities, tokenizing equities, tokenizing bonds, tokenizing uh, real estate. And when you tokenize that, then you start creating global markets for those assets across the world, because again, Ethereum is a global ledger. So I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that Ethereum is uh, Ethereum actually takes the idea of Bitcoin forward by making it programmable, by making it making it into a decentralized computer. Uh, it allowed us to build, you know, interesting financial applications for retail on it. Uh, you know, back in the day, this used to be called DeFi, which is called decentralized finance. Uh, and as that overall opportunity has moved, now that you see players like BlackRock and Fidelity enter, they, I, they understand this idea of tokenization and they see the potential of actually then taking that application and building, you know, tokenized funds, tokenized securities and so on and so forth. And when you have tokenized securities, you basically then are changing the market structure, right? You're changing how the exchanges, broker dealers registrars and you know different participants custodians actually operate in the system because the blockchain effectively replaces the role of many participants and actually helps you uh, streamline and disintermediate a lot of the market flows that happen because 
you know, anyone who's got access to the blockchain, whether it's the issuer of bonds or issuer of funds, or whether it's a market participant can then actually then participate in these open, transparent markets uh, and in a very sort of efficient way, because, you know, this is 24 by 7 settled. It's all, you know, you, you see how crypto is traded, right? Crypto is traded 24 hours. Uh, there is instant settlement. The transaction goes through in a matter of few seconds. And similarly, we have the opportunity to then take our real world assets and the real world securities and make it like, you know, as efficient as, you know, we trade crypto today. Uh, and that, you know, to that to many of these, you know, asset managers is the opportunity. So that's something to keep in mind in terms of what the future potential of this technology is. The future potential of this technology is to digitize global financial markets. This is a digitization way of global, just like you saw exchange traded funds in some ways digitize these markets. What we're going to do with the blockchain, we're going to start using blockchain for digitization of traditional markets or bring more markets, financial markets to the digital world uh, so that everyone can access them in any part of the world. Uh, and at the same time, you know, bring in market capital efficiency, instant settlement, all the positives of, of that. So that's a very strong uh, vision uh, that is being played. I'm not saying this is going to happen in the next year or two. But over the next five to 10 years, this is a very, very large opportunity that's playing out in the crypto space. This is exactly why you should be paying attention to crypto, because this is not just, you know, some speculative tokens or currencies or coins that people are playing around with. This is a technology, a foundational technology that's being, to, being built to digitize global financial markets. And there are many examples of that, right? We've seen Fidelity launch uh, a kind of a tokenized mutual fund. Uh, tokenized mutual fund with tokenized money markets. Those tokenized money markets are available on their own app. So you can go to their app, actually buy a tokenized mutual fund. So there are many examples that have actually started to come about in terms of how this technology is being used uh, to then you know uh, build interesting use cases. And then as a result of that, we've seen, you would have imagined like, why are these global banks and why are like global asset managers working in the space? So some of them are launching ETFs, some of them are launching digital asset exchanges, which can be used for security markets. Uh, a lot of people are building tokenization platforms. A lot of people are building crypto custody, just like you have stock custody or crypto equity custody, you have crypto custody as well. And that's another opportunity that's coming up for institutions. So we are seeing very meaningful institutional participation in crypto now to take this technology to the, you know, the next sort of uh, horizon in terms of what the applications are. And that's the very interesting use cases. Uh, I would also say interesting things like stable coins. So just like I explained to you about the digital dollar, we're seeing PayPal, Visa use this digital dollar for global payments, for global settlement, in saving their own transaction costs and so on and so forth. So uh, very interesting payments use cases are also emerging. Just like you see the likes of Paytm phone pay in India, uh, what we are now seeing is global fintech apps starting to use the digital dollar on the blockchain for making payments. So, you know, a lot of people ask us, is it just, just all speculative? I think we are starting to see the applications come about as well. And hence, you know, this 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 is not just a speculative speculative technology. It definitely is speculative because we, these, these coins and currencies are always moving in terms of price. But there is a lot of fundamental applications that are coming about, uh, which will give a lot of utility value uh, to these digital assets. And hence, it's very important to you know focus on this space uh, going forward. Uh, again, I'll skip some of these things. Overall, we think overall digital asset management industry, which is about $50 billion today, is going to become a $650 billion industry uh, with ETFs, with multi-asset funds. So just like you see your equity mutual fund industry, uh, we you will see a very similar uh, regulated asset management industry being built in the digital asset management space, very similar to the you know the the global mutual fund industry today, uh, and that's a very big opportunity uh, for institutional participants going forward. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably it, right? In terms of uh, things I wanted to cover, there are a lot of regulatory things that are happening in the space. Uh, you know, you know, we saw the SEC file cases against some of the crypto participants and. The crypto industry has fought back against the SEC. So the Grayscale case was a very important case, which actually helped the industry launch the ETF. This is why the ETF happened, because Grayscale won this case against SEC. Uh, and then Coinbase is fighting this case against the SEC. So over a period of time, we are seeing, and I, you would remember this happened in India also, that the crypto industry took the RBI to Supreme Court and ended up winning the case because it's kind of got to do with your basic rights of you know whether you can hold crypto or not. Uh, that is not to be decided by any central bank, but actually, you know, be decided by the citizens of the country. 
uh, and and I think on based on the same you know regulatory uh, arguments and based on very similar kind of uh, you know discussions where you know this is a new technology a new set of laws and regulations are needed to cover it uh, and as a result of which you know you're seeing the crypto industry take these you know regulators to the court to actually help them understand that you know you can't apply 100 year old laws to crypto when this technology has come about just in the last 14 years uh, you need new set of laws and regulations and that's to some extent has started playing out in singapore in hong kong in europe where a new set of regulations are coming in and to some extent i think now we are seeing the same movement happen in the us as well and that's why we see you know positive movement in crypto and that's why you see you know bitcoin kind of starting to move back again and starting to recover so yeah, I think that's the overall picture on crypto. I'll stop here uh, to see if there are any questions. Yeah, thanks, Gautam. And uh, quickly move to the Q&A sessions. Requesting everyone, whatever the questions you have, you can post it in the Q&A session. Uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan has asked, what are the regulations around crypto and are they sufficient and robust to green at the event cryptos? And what are the investment options for the retail investors across geos subject to the risk reward threshold? I think in India, what we will see is that uh, it will be a bit late in my view. Uh, and I think uh, it's, uh, it, it, you know, I think we will see the regulation clarity, regulatory clarity be achieved in the US and other global markets first. Uh, I think India will follow. Uh, I think RBI uh, doesn't fully appreciate the technology in my view. Uh, and, you know, doesn't understand the interplay between digital assets, crypto and blockchain technology. I think it's kind of just singularly focused on blockchain. Uh, in my view, that's a very that's a very difficult part to go on because the crypto and the digital assets are providing security to the blockchain. They are the incentive layer to the blockchain. So you cannot separate the two. Uh, but I do think that the central government understands it quite well uh, and is not in the mood to ban it. So in India, the situation is that it's not a ban. You can invest in it. Uh, I think there are many good crypto exchanges. Uh, I would not name any one of them, but uh, you can, you know, I think some of the good ones are starting to become quite popular. Uh, and uh, and you can buy and you can pay tax on it. So if you buy it, you, have, you there's a TDS. Uh, and then when you sell it, there's a, you know, there's a deduction that happens with the tax deduction that happens. And that becomes quite simple in terms of, you know, uh, making an investment just like you make any other investment there's a particular rate of tax that you pay with it and that's fine i mean it's perfectly fine to do that uh but you know i think is is it easy to kind of move money between the bank to exchange it's not that easy there are some exchanges which have banking relationships and you know so you can actually do that but yeah i mean i don't think it's a very supportive atmosphere in india uh there is no ban there is no regulatory restrictions uh, but it's not something that, you know, RBI comes out and says that people can do whatever they want. They're always saying negative things about, about crypto. Uh, and that probably doesn't create the right environment for people to actually understand this technology. It's very much influenced by uh, by by what the regulators are saying. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's fine. It's completely legal to do it. You have to pay tax whenever you actually make investments in it. Uh, but uh, I think for India to fully become a crypto hub, like how other global markets are becoming, it will probably take a couple of years. Uh, maybe something like in Gift City could happen, which is an offshore location. Uh, we'll see how it kind of goes. So thanks. Uh, next is why it's fixed numbers of Bitcoins. It is fixed by, 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 it's an algorithm. It's fixed by the code, by the program, the software code. It's not fixed by a human being. It was whoever launched the software code you know, it was called, the person was back then called Satoshi Nakamoto. He just disappeared. He's, he was anonymous. He just put it on the computer. People liked the code. They started using it. It went to now, as I said, 46,000 computers and 1 million miners. So now it's taken a life of its own. And there are people, there are software contributors who are voluntary who maintain the code. But, you know, because crypto, if they change the Price, if the number of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price will just slash and, you know, just fall down because the value is coming from that fixed number. So, you know, it's it's fixed because it's fixed by code. I mean, it's just like a computer which decides on its own what the supply will be and you cannot change that. Sure. Thanks. Next one is, are the ETFs only for Bitcoin or for the Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies as well? Right now, only for Bitcoin. So you can buy the BlackRock or Fidelity ETF uh in on the u.s markets uh 
it's uh, not for Ethereum. Ethereum is in process. We think it will could happen over the next three to 12 months. Uh, so we'll see how that happens. But yeah, right now it's only for Bitcoin. Got it. Uh, let me take this question, which is from Mr. Prabhu, that uh, does Aditya Irla have exposure to such kind of ETFs? And uh, of course, no. And any product called something named Digital, yes, uh, Prabhuji, the name of the product is Digital India Fund, uh, which invest in, which is related to the IT theme, which invest in IT, uh, small cap, mid cap, large cap, and not only IT hardware or the software, but the other interesting things like media or you know, the offshore investments, I mean, international equity exposure also up to a 5%. Uh, it's a very old fund in the industry. And of course, I think it has been beaten benchmark by handsome returns. It, it's a it's a very long-term product, which has been recommended for our investors. And it has been managed by Mr. Kunal Sangoi, but we'll have a separate session on this. Thank you for asking. Yeah. So it's one of its kind funds um, in the country. Very few uh, uh, IMCs have this kind of a fund and I think it's a, like Amit said, it's beaten benchmark by a far number and it's, it's a very interesting fund. But yes, of course, it has to be a long-term view only. Right. Thanks. Uh, Jigarji is asking, how will C CBDC impact the value of Bitcoin? Also, any changes in security of exchange post the fiasco in 2022? Yeah, that's a good question. I think CBDC is a digital rupee. Uh, and it will not impact the value of Bitcoin, nor will Bitcoin impact the value of CBDC. I think they are very different concepts. Uh, CBDC is nothing but a digital rupee, which will be issued uh, by the central, central government directly into the wallets of citizens of the country, right? So if you're in the India, the Indian government will decide to kind of issue CBDC, you know, obviously by RBI, uh, directly into the digital wallets of CBDC wallets of you know, of users uh, or, or citizens. Uh, and that can be used in multiple ways. It can be used as a monetary tool to kind of give incentives to people to direct behavior towards certain things or to give certain tax benefits, reliefs, et cetera, et cetera. So that has a lot of monetary applications. Bitcoin, like I said, is, you know, very similar to gold. So they're very different concepts. They're on different ledgers. The CBDC will be controlled by the RBI. In my view, the Bitcoin is controlled by no one or by, you know, very... Uh, decentralized set of actors in the world. Uh, and uh, that's the difference. Exchange and security exchange, yes, I mean, that's a big positive that's happened. If you buy the ETF, you don't deal with the exchange. Uh, you can straight away that ETF basically custody it in the most secure custody platform in the world, which is controlled by Coinbase. Uh, and Coinbase is a, you know, is a, is, a, is a custodian in the US under regulation and compliance. So it has, the world has gone from unregulated exchanges to regulated exchanges. And that because of that regulation and you know compliance and security, that environment is definitely improved. So if you're in the EDF, no problem. If you're on exchange like Coinbase, again, not a problem. Uh, and I think over a period of time in India also, you saw these exchanges register themselves with the financial intelligence unit in India because of money laundering and so on and so forth. That registration is also process has started. And that's been a big positive in India in my view. I don't think if the government wanted to ban it, they would have got these Indian exchanges to register with themselves. And and that's why I think, you know, over a period of time, Indian regulation will start to get better. And but you should definitely invest in an exchange. If you, you definitely keep your crypto in exchange, that's definitely registered with the money laundering if I use the fund financial intelligence unit in India. And that is a good check you should do before you actually look at an exchange in, in, in the Indian context. Sure. I would uh, uh, like to come in, Amit. I would want to answer uh, Pallavi's question and Gautam can add on. Uh, Pallavi has asked about uh, the fact that uh, that everybody is talking about all the good things, but there are a lot of reports which are available which say that crypto transactions and mining have a bad effect on the environment. Um, so, uh, Pallavi, you're absolutely right. One of the biggest that has a disadvantages of crypto is that the power that it draws uh, in the mining um, efforts uh, causes a lot of uh, environmental impact. So uh, as of now, at least I'm not aware of any, any mitigant to the environmental impact that um, Bitcoin mining has got because it does require a lot of computer power and it does require a lot of miners. So a lot of, lot of work happening on, um, on that. But um, yeah, as of now, I don't think there is any justification that we can give on that. Yeah, I think what has happened there is that it's a good question. Uh, what has happened is that a lot of Bitcoin miners, at least some of the miners I cover, have started generating Bitcoin using renewable sources. 
uh, and because they work very closely with the state, uh, you know, energy boards or energy grids, uh, they are able to provide a very sustainable source of demand for the for the grids, right? Because you know they, the miners are located in remote locations, uh, where usually that demand is not present. So they play a very important role with load balancing. They play a very important role in actually helping uh, use the excess supply of renewable energy, which you know usually gets wasted. Uh, so a lot of positives are also happening in the space. And I think generally, as the miners become more listed, more organized, uh, as investors focus on ESG and environmental factors on them, the listed miners at least are moving towards more en environmentally friendly practices and more envi en environmentally friendly partnerships uh, with energy utilities, uh, particularly in states like Texas, Georgia, that we are seeing. Uh, so that's a very important movement that's happening. And, uh, you know, it's something that you cannot now... I mean, I don't think Bitcoin is going away. Uh, so that energy consumption is anyways going to happen. Uh, only thing you can do now is actually use more energy friendly renewable sources uh, and play a more positive part in the communities uh, by, you know, providing a sustainable source of demand uh, and making sure that helps and actually reducing power cost for the other participants in the grid. Uh, and that's a very important uh, thing that's happening uh, in the crypto space. Sure. I think Nikhil, this question is on a similar front and let me take this question that is there any environment friendly fund, mutual fund scheme with Aditya Birla Sun Life mutual fund. So yeah, there is an ESG fund which is called Environment, Social and the Governance. And of course, uh, very interesting fund, very different portfolio. Uh, there won't be any portfolio overlapping. And of course, there is a, you know, very great buy call from our team for the long term investments as well. And uh, let's take this second last question from Mr. Sunilji. With so many different crypto coins coming up, does it not defeat the supply constant logic? Yeah, but they are not Bitcoin, right? There's only one coin, which is $1 trillion of market cap. I mean, a lot of Bitcoin replicas have come, but they don't make that kind of value creation, right? They probably remain between $1 to $2 billion and that they remain there. So, yeah, you can invest in like dogecoin and funny other coins but uh, there's only one bitcoin because all the like blackrock does not want to issue an etf of any other coin it wants to issue an etf of bitcoin right so hence i think it's important to understand the bitcoin and the rest and then you have to, then the other coins can be technology led right so the smart contract based chains blockchains like ethereum solana they have a different use case they use more for financial applications financial you know use cases like tokenization and so on and so forth and then there are a few other. so there are different categories and there are coins which are used in the gaming space and they have like gaming currency use cases uh, so you have to differentiate between different you know just like how you do industry analysis in the stock market you have to actually then do different segmentation in the crypto market to understand which are the different use cases and and not like even to say that ethereum is com competitive or bitcoin is wrong because ethereum is trying to do something else bitcoin is trying to do something else so there are sectors and there are sector verticals and in those verticals there are market leaders in the store of value vertical uh bitcoin or the digital gold vertical bitcoin is a market leader there's no competition in the smart contracts vertical, Ethereum and Solana are competitors. So they share market cap. You look at Ethereum's market cap is about 320 billion. Look at Solana's market cap. I think it's close to 20, 25 billion. So yeah, there are competitors in that space. So, but they're competing. They're like a technology. They're competing against that. So I think it's important to understand this space better to, you know, to understand, you know, you just can't take a one single view of, you know, scarcity. It's a very diverse space. I would like to take the question from Chinmoy Mandal. Um, he says few of the foreign stock exchanges are exploring to use blockchain technology to secure digital asset trading and settlements. Is there any plan for NSC or BSC? Uh, Mr. Mandal, let me tell you, the government is working a lot on how to use blockchain in a lot of utilities. There are a lot of areas, including uh, the BSC and the NSC, where there is a lot of work that is happening on this. There is also a lot of work happening in the real estate space. Uh, in terms of, you know, registrations and all that, where the government is working on making all this um, foolproof using uh, the blockchain technology. So I guess there's a lot of work that is happening on this front and you will see a lot more of this in the future. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Kamani. And the last one is from Mr. Sunilji. Uh, can you please describe what is a tokenization in simple language and how will it transform the financial world? And what will it replace? 
Tokenization is nothing but digitization, but digitization not on a database, but on a, on a blockchain. So if you take the idea of digitization and put it on a blockchain, that's an example of tokenization. So you could take like, let's say Apple stock and you can tokenize it. But when you put a tokenized Apple stock, that Apple stock becomes accessible to not just in the US market, it becomes accessible to you, right? So sometimes when you want to invest in Apple, maybe you can invest through some sources like an LRS and maybe invest through other debit last fund or something like that. But if you want to get direct access to Apple using the tokenized Apple stock, that could be, you know, become accessible in the future for you because the tokenized market become globally accessible. Uh, and at the same time, you could get tokenized mutual funds, which become again, globally accessible on Ethereum. So in a way, tokenization expands the market uh, from a very local jurisdictional driven market to a more global market. Uh, and at the same time, because it's digital, it is instant settled, uh, you know, just like if you see, you know, with how the, you know, how the, you know, stock transactions are settled on the exchanges. You know, usually there are different participants. There's a lot of reconciliation because there are multiple copies of the ledger. Uh, there is, you know, T plus one, D plus three, you know, things that over a period of time change. But with the blockchain, you get instant settlement because it's instant. The custody is on the blockchain. Uh, you don't need to reconcile it because of, it's because of single ledger transparency and so on and so forth. So uh, basically tokenization is a more digital efficient form of assets being on the blockchain. Sure. So thanks, Gautam. Thanks, Kavayani, for your presence. And once again, it's a very wonderful crisp session. Of course, the link of this recording session will send you all by the emails. And thank you, Gautam, for addressing. This is the second time you're coming and you know honoring our request. This is really very helpful. And of course, thank you to all our investors who join us on this Saturday morning uh, to giving us that confidence to schedule such kind of sessions on the regular basis. So once again, thank you and have a nice week. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Mutual fund Nivesh Bazar ke jokhimo ke adhin hai. Scheme sambandhi sabhi dastavezon ko dhyan se padhe.